Hello, I'm Rick Lancaster. Thank you for tuning in as we study through the Bible together. Grab your Bible and turn to 2 Corinthians as we go through a series I've entitled Power in Weakness. Through these messages, it is my hope that we will better understand how God's power operates in the life of a Christian. If you have any questions about anything in this teaching, send me a message. I would love to connect with you. With that said, let's get into the Word and see what the Spirit wants to say to us today. Starting a new book today. Turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians. Little known fact, 2 Corinthians is the last book of the New Testament for me to teach. As we get through this, I'll have taught through the entire New Testament. Where do you, where do you think I ought to go after that? Really? How many, how many want to go to the Old Testament? About four of you. Okay. The rest of you are going to have to just suffer through it then, I guess. I'm praying about Genesis. So we'll see. Leviticus. Isaiah. Yeah, I've taught that one a lot of times, so that's possible. We'll see. Anyways, can we, can we get to business here today? Is that okay? All right, why don't we open up in a word of prayer, and then we'll get into today's message. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this opportunity. Lord God, as we come into uh, what is uh, a, a time of year that we typically gather together as family and celebrate, and uh, Lord, that's a, that's a beautiful and sweet and precious time as, uh, as we've got, you know, we're blessed with Pastor Brandon and Unita and family here. Um, Lord, also, uh, you know, me personally, I'm blessed with my daughter and her family is here in town. Lord, it's, it's a neat time, Lord, for the family of God to gather and the family of our family to gather together. And we thank you for that. And Lord, as we come to this time, Lord, I pray, Lord, that you'd minister to us and this, uh, what is uh, not not that easy of a book uh, for us to study through. And so I lift it up to you and I pray, Lord, that you administer to your people as only you can. Lord, that um, we want to be open to hear what you have to say to your people. And Lord, even if we don't necessarily like what we hear, Lord God, we know that it's for our good and for your glory. And so we give it up to you now. We ask for your blessing upon it all. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So... 2 Corinthians, the letter that we refer to as 2 Corinthians uh, may actually be the fourth letter that Paul wrote to the church in Corinth. There are a couple of others, possibly a couple of, one other for sure, and there may be a, a fourth one that just didn't, didn't survive history. And so we have these two letters, and both of the letters that we get from Paul to the church in Corinth typically were were a response to something he heard about going on in the church. One of the sad realities about churches is that sometimes Christians act in a very un-Christ-like way, right? Can anybody say, yeah, I've seen that this morning, right? (laughs) Okay, it happens, right? You know, if we stopped all the sinners from showing up on a Sunday morning you know, there'd be a lot more empty seats around the place than we have already. So just, you know, that's the the reality. And, you know, and it freaks some people out. You know, they show up at a church and, you know, people act like, you know, like they're heathen pagans and they're, you know, people are freaked out about that. You know, that's, that's not how you're supposed to act. Well, that's right. You're not supposed to act like that. That's why you're here. So you learn how not to act like that, right? Isn't that, isn't that why you guys are here? to learn how to be more like Jesus? You're not here for me to entertain you, right? Because I got, I got sad news for you. That's probably not going to happen. I mean, people, I mean, if you read 1 Corinthians, which you should, it would be a good idea to read 1 Corinthians because it kind of sets a tone for 2 Corinthians. But 1 Corinthians, man, there was some weird stuff going on in that church. You know, they were, they were arguing about who to follow. You know, I'm following Barnabas. I'm following Paul. I'm following Christ. You know, they had all these, you know, had the little, they, were, they were fighting about who to follow. And Paul said, what are you doing? 
There were people that were being selfish and disrespectful during church fellowships, even getting drunk at, at church fellowships. Not really kind of very Christ-like. There was even a guy in the church that was in a weird relationship with his stepmother. Come on! What kind of church is that? Well, probably just like just about every other church in the world right now. So Paul wrote this letter to 1 Corinthians. Some of the people responded to it. And now he's writing a letter because something else has gone on. There's a new problem in the church. And the problem has to do with Paul. And it's a problem that, that we as Christians near the end of 2019, somebody say, please let 2019 be over soon. Man, this has been a hard year. But we need to watch out for this very thing in our own lives and in our church. What was going on was Paul's authority was being challenged. And that's not new. Paul's authority was getting challenged on a regular basis. But it's interesting the reason why it was being challenged. You know, they were, they weren't, it wasn't a direct assault on his credentials or his abilities. Nothing like that. Though there, there was a little bit of that going on. Instead, they were looking at Paul's life and they were evaluating the things that were going in and around Paul's life as proof that Paul did not have God's authority. In Paul's time, we've got to put this in context, in Paul's time, people are getting saved out of pagan religions. In those pagan religions, they were being taught in those religions that whatever supposed false god, this deity that they were worshiping, would either protect them from bad things or provide them with good things, right? I mean, that's pretty much what, doesn't anybody want that? I mean, I mean, that's kind of like our desire. I want the good, I don't want the bad, right? And so that's what these religions were teaching and practicing. And so when these people are getting saved out of those religions, coming into the church of God, what do you think their attitude toward God was? He's going to protect me from the bad and give me nothing but good, right? I mean, that, that would be a very natural thing. Well, that's exactly what was going on. It takes time to take your worldly viewpoints and change them to be Christ-like. That's why people come into the church and they do weird stuff. Because they bring all their old stuff with them. And it takes time to work some of those things out. We got people in this church, we've been working on them for decades. <laughs> Kelly? No, I didn't mention that. <laughs> She's working on me more than I'm working on her. And so people are coming in and, they're, and, they're, and, they, and the, the, what, they're, what they're doing is, is they believe, okay, if, if I'm a good Christian, then, then God's going to protect me from the bad stuff of life and he's going to give me the good stuff. That, that it's going to be this idea that, you know, that, that, that nothing bad will happen to me if I'm a good Christian. You know, it takes time to change those. And they're looking at Paul. Paul was Paul's life. He was, get, he was going through affliction and trials. And, and he was being stoned and shipwrecked and beaten and imprisoned. And they're saying, dude, this, guy's, this guy can't be a good Christian. He can't be right with God. Just look at all the stuff that's happening in his life. All the bad, the bad stuff that's happening in his life. He cannot be right with God. That's what they're saying. Say, we shouldn't listen to him. We shouldn't, we shouldn't receive his authority because of this. They were operating under the false idea that if you are a good Christian, God will make you happy, healthy, and wealthy. Does that sound familiar to anybody? They looked at his life. They did not see worldly happiness. There was trouble in his life. There was difficulty. There were problems in his life. They saw trials and tribulations and persecution and all these things going on in his life. And says, this guy, this guy, he cannot be much of a Christian. Not if all this bad stuff's happening. You know, 2,000 years hasn't changed people's viewpoints. You know that, right? The gods have changed. 
Now the gods come from Wall Street and Fifth Avenue and Silicon Valley. Facebook, Netflix, Google are our gods. Not our gods, but the gods of this world. And they're influencing people and causing them to have these attitudes that, you know, once, you're, once those attitudes are in you, you know, they, you take them with you everywhere you go, including to church and your relationship with God. Today, as much as it grieves my heart to say it, there are pastors that are teaching a gospel of happiness, health, and wealth. That if you'll just, you'll just do whatever it is they think you ought to be doing, you're going to be happy. God will make you happy. He will keep you healthy. He will make you wealthy. And if you're not any of those things, it's a problem of faith. That's what they're going to teach you. That's what they're going to tell you. If you have enough faith, you will be happy, healthy, and wealthy. Well, I'm here to tell you that is a false gospel. And the problem is, when these pastors get up and preach that, you know what the people do? Amen, pastor! Preach it! Why? Because that's exactly what they want, right? I want you to tell me, or you want me to tell you, here, here, here's the formula to happiness, health, and wealth, Right? Anybody, anybody love to hear a three-step process to happiness, health, and wealth? I know I would. If I start preaching that, you get up and run. Here's the deal. The, mes the message of 2 Corinthians is not a popular one. It's not a popular one. As I was doing my studying, some of the commentators are saying it's probably one of the least preached books in the New Testament. Because its message is not popular. Did you know that God has not promised happiness, health, or wealth to Christians? Did you know that? It's not a promise. It doesn't mean he's going to deny us that. It just means he hasn't promised it. God is God. He will do what he wants to do with whomever he wants to do it in whatever way he wants to do it. The problem with the happiness, health, and wealth gospel is that it causes people to expect God to keep a promise he never made. That's what's happening with that, with that gospel message, that message that God promises you to be happy, that if you have enough faith, you'll be happy, healthy, and wealthy. And if you expect God to do that, what happens if you have problems in your life? What are you going to do? Who are you going to blame? Certainly not going to blame yourself, right? It can't be my fault because, hey, don't you know who I am? Don't you see how good I am? I'm such a good Christian. We cannot expect God to keep a promise he never made. But too often, that's what's being preached in many of these, these happiness health and wealth gospel churches. And someone, someone isn't happy, some, someone has trouble in their lives, they have relationship issues or they have, they have health issues or, or money issues, they lose a job, they, someone gets sick or dies or whatever it is, Yet what are they left with? Questioning. Questioning the God who's promised them things that are not the same as what they're believing he promised them. They get angry at God. Anybody heard, seen somebody get angry at God because something bad happened in their lives? Mad at God. Because that shouldn't have happened. They might even turn away from him. Listen, God is always faithful to keep his promises. Always. He never breaks a promise that he's made to us. But, he is not faithful to keep promises he didn't make, right? Does that, does, that, does that make sense? God does not have to keep a promise he didn't make. And 2 Corinthians is going to show us some things. It's going to teach us how God chooses to operate in this world, how he does it through people to show his power, 
God is powerful. He's working in this world. He's manifesting his powers in ways that we need to be watching for it. We need to see it. It is there. God is real, right? We believe that. He's still acting and operating in this world through the Holy Spirit. His power is the same today as it was 2,000 years ago, as it was at the very beginning of creation. It's the same power operating in the world that it was in the time of Christ as it is today. Question is, is God going to find, when, he, when he's looking, is he going to find somebody through whom his power can move? In 2 Chronicles 16.9 says this, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. I want you to notice something there. It does not say that he's going to show himself strong on behalf of those who are strong. Right? Did you know that? God is not looking for strong people to show himself strong through. It's he's looking for people who will be loyal to him. We see, what we'll see through this text is not only is God not looking for strong people, he's looking for the exact opposite. He's looking for weak people. People, people that, that manifest weakness in their own lives and hearts and situations. Near the end of this letter, Paul shares something God told him. Second Corinthians 12, 9. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Perfect in weakness. And as far as we can tell, Paul was a very faithful Christian, right? We saw his faithfulness. He manifested his faithfulness to God, enduring things that most people would, would collapse under just, the furry, just a couple of those things. And yet Paul endured great suffering to serve God. And yet God worked powerfully through him. And this, this, these difficulties that Paul endured which is what the, the people in Corinth are pointing to and questioning his ability actually to minister or were, were the catalyst through which God's almighty power was manifested. It was through his going through these difficult things. Things that were impossible for him in his own power to get through. God was getting him through those things and God's power was showing up in great force. And so today, as we begin this study through what is called 2 Corinthians, I've entitled it Power and Weakness. And it's my prayer that through this study, we're going to better understand how the power of God works in the world today and see how our weakness is not something that we should, we should uh, be embarrassed about or ashamed about. Matter of fact, Paul's going to say in some points that he boasts in those things. And the reality, dude, I can't do any of this, but God, God can, God can show up, God can do, God can do what I can't. Paul starts this letter like he does most letters, most of his letters. Second Corinthians chapter one, verse one, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, with all the saints who are in all Achaia. Remember, there's a challenge going on to Paul's authority. So the very thing he opens up with, one of the things he opens up with, was the fact that he didn't volunteer to be an apostle. If we remember his story back in Acts chapter 9, when, when he was on his way to do what? You remember what he was doing, what he was planning to do in Damascus? He was trying to destroy the church. He was attacking the church. And Jesus shows up, knocks him off of his donkey, blinds him and says, hey, I got a job for you. Paul's detractors are pointing to all of these afflictions, all these difficult things in Paul's life and questioning, saying he can't be a true apostle with all these things going on. 
The, exact, the opposite is, is what's actually true. In Acts 9, verses 15 and 16, read this. But the Lord said to him, him being Ananias, who was going to tell Paul what God had planned for him, go, for he's a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel, for I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. I mean, let me tell you something about being a pastor. It's hard. I am so thankful God didn't do this with me. Because I would have run. I, I, I was a salesman in, in a former life. I would have sold anything rather than doing this if I knew what it was, what it would cost me before I did it. But he had a different plan. He showed Paul in advance what was coming. That is a remarkable thing to me. Imagine that. You're going to be shipwrecked three times. You're going to spend a day and night in the sea. You're going, to be, you're going to be flogged repeatedly. You're going to be beaten with rods. You're going to be imprisoned. You're going to be rejected. You're going to be chased out of towns. You're going to be one thing after another. He showed him all of these things. And Paul said, okay, let's go. That's a, that's a bad dude right there. Paul's suffering was proof that he was right where God wanted him to be. Even though they're saying, oh, he can't be much. He can't really be a true apostle because all this stuff's going on. Nope. Proved the exact opposite. Paul was exactly where he was supposed to be. Verse 2. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Of the 17 times that the phrase grace and, and peace show up in the New Testament, in this format, they're always in that order, grace and then peace. And, the, and the, what we get out of that, what we extract from that is the reality that without the peace of God, or without the grace of God, excuse me, there can be no peace, either with God or with other people. Grace must come first. Also notice that it's from the grace and peace are from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That without Jesus, there can be no grace or peace. Verse 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in trouble with the comfort with, we, with, which, we, with which we ourselves are comforted by God. One of the things that as we're reading and studying through the Bible that we ought to be looking for are repeated words. They're, they're always a clue or a sign of something you ought to pay attention to. And one word is repeated five times in those two verses. Anybody catch it? Comfort. That's right. In fact, in verses 3 through 7, the word comfort appears 10 times, or it's a form of it appears 10 times. So, therefore, the theme of these verses is giving right? I always love pastors who can, who can pull weird themes out of, you know, out of thin air. Well, you know, God gives comfort. Therefore, we ought to be giving comfort. Therefore, we ought to be giving people. So give, give your money. What? No, it's about comfort. It's about God's comfort. And the word comfort, uh, as um, R. Kent Hughes defines it, I like this definition, to stand by another and encourage him as he endures testing. Hey, hey, let's be real. Life sometimes is hard, right? Sometimes it's hard. Difficult things happen. And you know, and you know they happen to good people and bad people. Did you notice that? Did you know that? But the hard things happen to both good people and bad people. It happens to Christians and unbelievers. You know, you know that? Bad things happen to really good Christians and marginal Christians. That's just the way life is. It's not a matter of faith. You know, the way things happen in your life, that things happen in your life is not a matter of faith. Faith comes in after they happen. It's how we handle those things. And one of the things that helps us through the hard things is the comfort of those who come alongside us during our difficulties. 
Verse 3 tells us that all, all comfort, I want you to notice that, all comfort comes from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 4 also tells us that it comes from another source. You know, most of you know that my mother had a stroke in August and then went to be with the Lord in September. I'm mature enough in my faith to have felt the Lord's comfort directly. I did. I felt him comforting me through that. But I'm not so mature as to, as to not need more than that. And I did. I'm so thankful that God placed around me and around my family, especially from within this body of believers, people that, that comforted me with the, God, with the comfort of God. I'm especially thankful because many of those people had already been comforted by God through similar things. And I can't say that I'm thankful for the pain they had to suffer so they could comfort me, but I am thankful that they were willing to share God's comfort with me and with my family. And because I've experienced that comfort, this was one of the weird things for me as I went through this stuff. I've ministered to people for two decades. I've ministered to, I don't know how many people who have lost siblings, spouses, children, parents, grandparents. I've ministered to a lot of people in my life. Romans 8.28 says to us, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, and to those who are called according to his purpose. Last Sunday, as we were fellowshipping, someone came up to me and shared with me they had just that week lost their mother. And, and I, I am in a place now where I am ministering to this person from a completely different perspective. Even though I'd ministered to all those other people before that, all of a sudden I'm ministering from the perspective where I am giving to this person a comfort that I had not previously known. I knew, I knew theologically how to do it. I knew doctrinally how to do it. I knew, I knew scripturally how to do it. But I knew something different. I was able to give something that previously I didn't have. Paul goes on to say something similar. Verse 5. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. Now, if we are afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effective for enduring the same sufferings which we also suffer. Or if we are com comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. For our hope for you is steadfast, because we know that as you are partakers of the sufferings, so also you'll be partakers of of the consolation. Just sum all that up. Paul is saying that, that everything that he's gone through benefits them. And the things that they're going through are going to benefit others. And it should remind us that everything that happens in our lives is important and valuable to God. Everything. That there is no, there is no unimportant detail of your life. The good, the bad, the easy, the hard. All of it is used by God to reveal his glory, bless others, and grow faith. Every bit of it. And anyone tells you that Christians shouldn't go through suffering hasn't read their Bible. One of the places, you know, you know, you know don't think it's strange when these things happen to you. Remember? You know, don't think it's strange. What does that mean? That means it's not strange when those things happen, when difficult times, when testing comes, when trials happen in your life. That's not strange. That's life. And there are many reasons why these things happen. Many reasons why these hard things happen in our lives. Sometimes we cause them. You know, we bring them upon ourselves through our own, our own lack of faith or our own, our own sin and wickedness. You know, we, we do our own, we, you know, we, we choose to do what we want to do sometimes. Another reason we've already been told is so that we can comfort others, so that we can have the comfort that we need 
you know, so that God, as God comforts us through our difficult times, that we can then share that comfort with others. They also do something else. Psalm 119, 71 tells us, it is good for me that I've been afflicted. Anybody ever said that? It's good for me to go through this. Not while you're going through it. I promise you won't say that. It's good for me that I may learn your statutes. We learn about God when we go through some of the hard things of life. Now, we learn about him through, we can learn about him through all kinds of things. But there are some things about God that we cannot learn unless we're being, we're in the midst of difficult things. We're being afflicted in some way. And, and through that, God comforts us and we learn something about his nature, his character, about him. We also go through those things because that's the example that was set for us. This is a hard one. 1 Peter 2.20, when you do good and suffer, we just say, yeah, sign me up for that. If you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. God approves of that. When you're, when you're mistreated or abused or you suffer after doing something that's good in his eyes, and you endure it, patiently you put up with it without whining and complaining and running and you know getting all ugly that's commendable before god for to this you were called because christ also suffered for us leaving us an example that you should follow his steps the gospel of happiness health and wealth is false and it is leading people to destruction. But so is the gospel that all Christians must endure a life of suffering. That's not true either. God can do what he wants to do with us. If he, if he doesn't take you through a pathway of suffering, praise him. Loudly praise him. We understand Paul was called to a very specific life, to a life of service to God, unlike anything that, has, uh, that had preceded him and probably unlike most of anything that's gone after him. He was called to this life, and that life included suffering, which God showed him in advance. And in fact, history shows us that, that people who are called to do great things for God often endure great things from God. Paul is an example of that. You know, how many of us, if you've ever read all the stuff that Paul went through, how many of us would have checked out long before we got to the end of that list? You know, we, we, we got to be careful when we read stuff like that. We think, oh, well, you know, he was Paul. Didn't bother him. You know, he was the Arnold Schwarzenegger of, you know, of, of that time. You know, he was bulletproof, invincible. He could take it. You know, it didn't bother him. Well, okay, let's read verse 8. For you do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond measure, above strength, so that we despaired even of life. Yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a death and does deliver us, in whom we trust that he will still deliver us. What is he saying? He's saying that it was so bad that whatever was going on, that we don't, history doesn't tell us what it was that was going on at this particular time. We see a lot of other stuff, but we don't know the specific thing that was going on here, but it was so bad that they thought they were going to die. It's all over. We're done. We're, I mean, whatever is going on, it's going to end us. And they looked at it, and they were absolutely hopeless. There was no way out of it. And the only, the only way they could see was through death. It was the only way they're getting out of it. Verse 9 is really important for us, especially if you're a mature believer. Paul was about as mature a believer as existed on earth at that point. Wouldn't you acknowledge that? Very mature. I mean, he was probably one of the greatest Christians that ever walked on this earth. And he says, 
that one of the reasons why they were afflicted so severely was that we should not trust in ourselves but in God. That's a radical thing that he says there. It happened. One of the reasons it happened is so that we wouldn't put our trust in ourselves. Did, did Paul trust God? Uh, yeah, but not perfectly. Not perfectly. And so God allowed this affliction in his life to purify and perfect Paul, to make him better, to make him more like Christ. Matthew 22, verse 36 and 37 says this, Teacher, which is the great commandment of the law? Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. God's not done with you until he has all of you. Until all of you is like Jesus, he's not done with you. And he's going to use whatever tool he has to to help make you be more like Jesus. He can do it through revelation. He can show you things in, your, in his word. As you're praying, he can reveal himself to you. He can reveal your, himself to you in nature. But sometimes he's got to bring out, you know, the hammer and chisel and break chunks off of you. Sometimes he's got to put you in the heat, in the fire to purify you. That's part of the process. So sometimes affliction happens. Any church that tells you you shouldn't have to go through affliction, Christian, what, you know what they're telling you? You don't have to change. Just be like you are. God doesn't care if you stay the way you are. Yeah, I'm not buying that. I'm pretty sure he wants you to change. He wants you to be better. He wants you to be like his son. You know why? Because that's the best life possible for you. The life that you're living right now, if you stay in that life, that's not the best life you could live. There is always a better life. I, can, I, I, I would suggest to you, and we've read some of, you know, if you read like 2 Timothy, you read, you're reading Paul near the end of his life. He doesn't look back on his life and say, man, that was miserable. That's not the sense you get. You get the sense you get is he loved what he was doing. He loved his life. He was never afraid to say, hey, you know what? This is hard. But he wouldn't change it. God's not done with you. And affliction, as much as we might dislike it, is one of the tools he uses to make us better, to make us more like Jesus. And while God will bring affliction into our lives only when necessary and only for as long as is necessary. Verse 9 ends with a reminder that God has the power to deliver us from whatever it is going on in our lives. It says he has the power, God who raises the dead. You know, God can raise the dead. Is there any limitation to what he can do? And the answer is no, he can do anything. So when you're in affliction, if you're being faithful to God and you're in a difficult time in your life and things are hard, things are not the way that you want them to be, what you need to understand is God's trying to do something there. He's trying to teach you something. It may be to trust in him more, not in yourself. It may be just trying to reveal, who, who knows? I mean, ultimately, ultimately you know, that's between you and God. Only he, you and he can figure out what that thing is. You know, we're here to help as much as we can, but ultimately it's something you have to figure out with God. And he's only going to leave you as long as you need to be. Trust him for that. And if he can raise the dead, he can solve your problems too. God, by his nature, is a deliverer. And verse 10 tells us that he's done in the past, he's doing it right now, and he will do it in the future. That's kind of cool, right? Whatever's going on in your life, okay, he's, gonna get, he's got you through stuff in the past. You know, if, we, if we're honest with ourselves, we can look at our lives and say, okay, yeah, God's got me through some stuff in the past. And whatever I'm going through now, okay, if he did it in the past, he can do it right now. And if he can do it right now, whatever comes in the future, he can take care of that too. And ultimately, we all know as believers in Jesus Christ, we have the ultimate deliverance, right? We're going to heaven. Delivered from not only the power of sin, but the very presence of sin. I love that. Verse 11 is a reminder of our duty to one another. You also helping together in prayer for us 
that thanks may be given by many persons on our behalf for the gift granted to us through many. There's something mysterious about prayer. It's one of those things, and I think it's one of the reasons why we struggle with it. It's a little bit ethereal. You know, it's kind of out there. We're kind of, we're, we're praying to this God we can't see. And we're, you know, we're not sure how they're being received. It's just something mysterious about it. And then there's a reality that God is absolutely sovereign in the universe. He knows everything. And including, he knows what he's going to do in every circumstance in advance. But then he invites us to pray. And to intercede on behalf of others and to pray as if we have an influence there of some way. It's a very mysterious thing that he does there. But he tells us something. He tells us over and over again to pray, to come before him, to bring our petitions before him. He tells us how to do it. He tells us repeatedly that we should do it. And that we have to have our heart in the right place before we do it over and over and over again. There's something about prayer that's very mysterious, but it's absolutely vital to our faith. And it also is important for other people. James 5.16 says this, The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. I also put the New Living Translation up there because I think it also says it well. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. Prayer changes things. I don't know why. I don't know how it works. I just know that it does. I don't know. I don't understand the mechanics of it fully, but I recognize I'm called to do it, and God promises me that if I do it, he's going to hear me. Praying for each other is so vital. It is vital for your faith. If you're not actively praying for others, your faith is lacking something. It's not whole. Now, and, I, and I mean more than just your immediate people and needs. We need to be reaching out beyond ourselves in prayer. As Paul is talking to the Corinthians, the, the Corinthians were praying for him and his companions. And he recognized that there was great power in that. On Thursday, we're going to celebrate Thanksgiving. You know, I, I can't, as we go into it, that particular holiday, I can't say that I'm thankful for everything that has happened over the last few months. But I have, I have so many things to be thankful for. I am thankful for the comfort that God has shown me through the comfort that he has given to us through others, especially the people of this church. Thankful for the way that he's revealed himself to me. I've, I've experienced things about God. I've learned things about God that were, were foreign to me before. I didn't, I didn't understand them. I knew maybe theologically some of these things, but I didn't really understand them until I went through some of these things. I'm thankful for the ways that God, I'm thankful for the fact that God raises the dead because that's a promise to me that I'm going to see my mother again. And that gives me joy as I think about it. I'm thankful for the prayers of righteous men and women that have been given, offered to me and to my family because they love me. I don't understand that because I know me, but I know I'm getting far more than I deserve. I'm thankful to be a part of the Church of God of, in French Valley. It's a blessing to me. And even though this has been a, a season of, if you will, affliction for our family, I know we're not alone. You know, I've spoken to many people. <laughs> 2019 has been rough for a lot of people. And we're going to hope in 2020 that it's going to be different. But if it's not, you know what? I'm going to trust God as much as, or probably more next year than I did this year because I know I'm trusting him more this year than I did last year and we're going to keep clinging to the reality that God is good and I'm going to rest in the reality that he will comfort us and no matter what happens and here's the thing that as we rest in the reality of God's comfort and we and we trust in God more and more the 
power of God starts to manifest for more fully through our lives. People see God more clearly. They see him operating out of us. And that changes the things around you. Often, if we would just allow God to work in and through our lives, even in the midst of difficult situations in our lives, they would change just because we're letting God work. We're letting his power out. And so we take this time, especially as we go in this time of thanksgiving, and I know some of you, again, going through some difficult times, there are so many things to be thankful for. Let's pause and be thankful. If nothing more, be thankful for a God who loves you enough to comfort you in your affliction. Amen? Amen. Heavenly Father, we come to you with thankful hearts. Regardless of our circumstances, regardless of our, our history, regardless of the things we've lost, the things that have been taken, the things that are hard, the things that are, that are not right in our lives. We're thankful, Lord God, that we have so many things to be thankful for that we sometimes, we, sometimes get, we sometimes lose sight of that just because it gets hard. And Lord, as we, as we study this, this book and especially the life of Paul and see how those, those things did not, did not prevent him from rejoicing in you and being thankful to you. Lord, neither should we. We should be quick to thank you for all that we have, all that, all that you're doing in us and through us. Even something as simple as being thankful for those who are praying for us. I know in my own life, I am very thankful for that. As regularly, I have people telling me that they are praying for me. <laughs> and and. You know, as a part of me, you know, I don't know if they're actually doing it or not. But it encourages me even just to hear the words. Because I know that even if they aren't, I know you are. The Bible tells us clearly that you, Jesus, are praying for your people. The Holy Spirit interceding on our behalf. That both God the Son and God the Holy Spirit interceding to God the Father on my behalf. That comforts me when I need it. And I pray, Lord, that we as people would trust you enough to allow your comfort to wash over us, to encourage us. And that, Lord, if we need it, that we would allow others to do the same, that we would allow others to comfort us. And sometimes that's hard to allow people into your life in that way. And, Lord, I know there are people here that are going through difficult times. There are other people that aren't going through difficult times. And so I pray, Lord, that you would bless them for that, Lord. I, I don't believe that any Christian is, is, must suffer to be a good Christian. And anyone that says otherwise, I believe, doesn't know their Bible. So whether we're in the midst of affliction or we're not, Lord, let us be thankful. Let us rejoice. Let us draw near to you. Let us point others to you. Let us be a people that loves you and each other so much that we be quick to comfort one another. I thank you for this time and this place. And I pray, Lord God, that you would help us, Lord, to be um, comforters just as we have been comforted. We praise you. We thank you. We love you. We give this day to you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for watching this teaching from 2 Corinthians. It's one of my core beliefs that the Bible or Word of God has the power to transform lives. It's my hope that these messages out of 2 Corinthians will help you to glorify God, bless others, and grow faith. If there's anything we can do to help you with that, please don't hesitate to ask. In the show notes, you will find my sermon notes as well as my study notes to help you in your study of God's Word. Sometimes we need help to grow in the faith. If there is anything that I can do to help you with that, don't hesitate to connect with me. I love talking to people about God and His Word. So send me your questions and I will do my best to answer them. This message was shared at Calvary Chapel French Valley in Murrieta, California. If you'd like to find out more about the church, go to calvaryfv.com. The link is in the show notes. Until next time, Stay in the Word and have a radical week with Jesus.